Hello everybody, John 6 Wade here. Um, this is a video on some of the changes that have been made to Unconditional Surrender with the uh, 2022 September 30th errata. <coughs> some of the big changes. Uh, the game is Unconditional Surrender, designed by Salvatore Basta, published by GMT Games. Um, I have loaded up a scenario. Uh, one of the things that I did uh, in the file, if you look here under, I have a complete set here of the 2022 errata updated setups for the ones that mattered. Um, so if you don't want to play with the errata, you don't have to. You can play the original. Uh, I felt it give you the option to playing either way. So. Um, I'm going to show you, I picked this one here, the main event errata updated, to show you some of the differences that are in the game right now. Uh, one of the big things, uh, you'll notice that there's no shock armies in October, November of 41. Those are now going to be conditional events. Those will be based on when East Invaded starts. Uh, two shock armies and, and the tanks marker will come in four turns later. Another two shock armies five turns later, and then four infantry and the airplane that used to come in January of 42 will come with the four infantry at six turns after East Invaded. So if you invade early, like April or May, you're only going to have basically four turns before reinforcements in serious amount start showing up in Soviet Union. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, with the new reinforcement rules, that's going to be a problem. The other thing that moved is the 17th Infantry used to be in December of 40, it's now in December of 41, and used to have the 15th Infantry in January of 41, it will come now in January of 42. So <clears throat> you're going to be down a couple infantry units when you go into the Soviet Union as well. Uh, this thins out the German line, people were complaining that it was too easy for the Germans to collapse the Soviet Union. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but um, a lot of that depend, depends on the diplomacy things. Um, one of the other things, where's my silly little... One of the things that got added, so I'm going to go over here. There is now a new restricted area here in uh, on the road to Persia or whatever. So these four hexes are now restricted USSR hexes. So the USSR has some place to launch their offensive back towards Tiflis, Batum. Uh, Granzia still can be sealed off in this hex here. And then up here outside of Saratov, there's also a couple more restricted hexes. Uh, pardon my art, I'm not nearly as good as the original artist and putting in the little red dotted lines. I tried to put something here to, rec to show you that they existed. Um, I didn't use the italics and everything in the same font and stuff. I couldn't figure that out. But I wanted to get this out here so people could test it and see how it looked. So there's another couple hexes here for restricted USSR that the Soviet Union can, you know, try and launch an attack back towards the Volga, towards Stalingrad, Saratov, along with the originals that were always here. Um, what does that mean? Uh, it means that there's no more, uh, you know, it used to be one, two, three, four, five, six garrisons could seal off the entire southern part of the Soviet Union. And then the Germans could toy with the idea of just letting the, Ger the Russians, the Soviets, try to fight their way out of restricted areas uh, in the northern bastion. Um, I have never found a situation where it was worthwhile to do that as the Germans. If I've gotten that far, it's usually better to just go ahead and collapse the Soviet Union because then you have at least a year, sometimes as long as 15 or 16 turns where you don't have any strategic warfare with them, which means your economy will stay pretty much at full and you can deal with whatever the West is screwing around with. Um, so, but it does make that, uh, it almost encourages the Germans to collapse the Soviet Union and so then when the Soviet comes back, they'll come back along this line. 
Uh, one of the things that they did change is when the Moscow Treaty gets placed, um, if you collapse the Soviet Union with the policy evaluation marker still on the board, in other words, you let's say you go after them in 1940 and you collapse them in 1940, um, or even in four, January of 41, it will go six turns after the evaluation marker. So even if you try to do, uh, there's sort of a long opening where you don't actually, you declare on the Soviet Union, but you just like take Poland and then play around taking miners and things like that and getting allies down here, <coughs> leaving the, the West to kind of sit, um, and then attacking into the Soviet Union come... Uh, 1941, and collapsing them in 41, or the first turn of 42, um, that will pretty much just have them come back in in the, in the winter of 42, instead of the winter of 43, because the policy evaluation marker will still be on the board. So it's kind of nerfing the long game from that standpoint. Um, I have not played a long game on purpose for a very long time. Uh, I was on the Allied side in one where the, the Germans just couldn't uh, couldn't muster enough to take out the Soviets early enough, and so they just decided to uh, stretch the game out in the hopes that they could pull something off. And the first major Soviet offensive in 1943, and they just resigned. They didn't want to play anymore, so... We never did get to finish that one. But, uh, so I think it's going to nerf up the, the long game. I haven't quite tinkered with the long game enough. It takes, it literally takes too long to figure out if it works or not for me. Um, the biggest change is in the diplomacy game. In the diplomacy game, they have added two things. Number one, one that I think that was kind of needed is it takes three successes to activate Turkey, Italy, and Spain. Okay, that sounds reasonable. But then they added another level, which says when you want to play a political success, you can only play a political success if you're adjacent, adjacent to an active country. So... A political success, it used to be you'd conquer Poland, you'd drop a political success in Romania, which kind of forced the Soviets, if they got the chance, to take Bessarabia early so that they had the defensive lines. Otherwise, the Germans might get lucky if they got a decent pull, 4 out of 13. On the very first pull, they could have Romania in the war in September of 39. You can't do that anymore. You conquer Poland, you have to be playing that political success. It's called a restricted political success. It has to be adjacent to an active country, and it has to be adjacent to the country you just conquered. Which means you can put it in Lithuania, you can put it in Hungary, and you're done. Those are your two choices. Neither of which are appealing to the, to the Germans. Reason being, Hungary is usually needed to be conquered because you need, um, you need the political successes in the cup. Uh, you need an extra pro marker in the cup. So Hungary tends to be conquered a lot in this game, uh, rather than allied. Um, I think they were trying to get you to not do that. All it did is it makes it work a little differently. Uh, the whole adjacency thing is going to completely hamper any hope of the Axis getting um, Scandinavian countries. They just can't do it. Um, they did change the political failure to being a... Uh, unrestricted political success for the person who's opposing, like the Soviets pull it, the Germans get enough, uh, an unlimited political success. Um, and that way you could place like pro markers in Sweden, Norway, or Finland, but you still have to be adjacent to get the second one to go off, to activate them. So you still aren't going to get very far here. Um, it basically just locks out the whole um, Scandinavian gambit, as I call it, where the Germans go to try and get Sweden to help them take out uh, Norway 
you know, they invade Norway, put a pro marker in Sweden, try to get a political success or a pro marker pulled. They activate Sweden. Sweden helps garrison the Norwegian ports. Uh, gives you an active country next to Finland. So if the Soviets don't ever remove the marker there, you have a chance to activate Finland before they, um, before the war. So you can actually be attacking them on the northern front as well. All of that's out the window. Uh, that's just not going to happen. It would take extremely bad luck on the Allied part to pull it off. And unlimited political successes are probably not going to be spent in Scandinavia. They're going to be spent in the Balkans and Italy. Because you need three to make Italy come in. Um, so it also reduces the reason to go after Norway and even Denmark to some extent. Uh, Denmark is usually used to remove a pro marker by the Allies that's in an inconvenient place like Yugoslavia or something. But in general, I don't see a reason to even bother with going north at all at this point. That's just my personal opinion. I have played through eight games, stopping when I get to like May or June of 41, because that's when you go into attacking Barbarossa and it political is over. And I've only ever gotten Italy once in eight games. Uh, the three pull, the three uh, marker goal is nigh impossible to get, it seems, because all it takes is one or two lucky pulls by the by the West or the Soviets, and they reduce one of your successes here in Rome. And you only have a limited number of successes you're ever going to get as the Germans until you go attacking into France. Then you're going to get some for Netherlands and Belgium and stuff. But, um, yeah, it seems like it's swung things awfully, an awful lot towards the West in the Soviet, to, to the Allies, as far as the diplomacy game goes. Um, so that's another thing you have to pay attention to. In the Vassal game, you know, you've got to remember all these rules. Uh, in the board game arena version, that has not been implemented. The developer is has several projects going. This one was finished with the essentially the uh, 2020 one 2020 2020 errata or whatever was implemented. Um, so you know you can play up to that point, but with the new rules, uh, the board game arena uh, will not be enforcing that anytime soon. I uh, don't know when the developer will be able to get time to do it or if he'll relinquish it to another serious programmer to try and implement those changes. Um, right now, he doesn't want to uh, have to deal with someone else's uh, coding style. So I understand that. Having programmed for 40 years myself, I understand quite well that you really don't want people messing with your code. Um, especially since from what he told, uh, what he's related to us in the development threads and things, uh, this thing, he had to take the basic framework of that Board Game Arena has, and he basically had to write, like, exceptions to make everything work. <laughs> so it's a stack of code that's just full of, like, 10,000 lines worth of code, and probably 7,000 lines of it is exception code to allow the conditions of the game to be actually carried out. So that's something to keep in mind, that Board Game Arena will not reflect the current state of the living rules. So it's a slightly different game than what you're playing here. It's an older version of it. If you play it with the living rules, I suggest that you play it in Vassal to test things out and see how it works. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, like I said, in the Soviet faction card now, you'll see that uh, there's a stack of the, the shock armies. And he did change the the order of when the the extra tank marker comes in. Uh, where did I put that tanks one? I put it here somewhere. Yeah, it's there. Uh, with the fourth air, the tanks marker is going to come in in four turns after East invaded. So they'll have a little bit better defensive capability four turns in. Uh, they'll also start building some shock armies and stuff, so they'll have the ability to withstand an early German assault. So, yeah, it's... That, I think, was kind of warranted, although it almost makes it if the Germans are not really set. A lot of times the Germans go in May or June just because they have fair weather and they want to get started. Um, now I might be willing to go ahead and wait until July anyway. 
Because that means that the Soviet reinforcements will all come a turn later, which means they won't be as effective in the first Russian winter. So there is that to consider as well. Um, what else did they change? I think that's it. The biggest one is the diplomacy rules. Um, the whole adjacency thing stacked with the three, um, three successes needed. Um, I think one or the other would have been fine. Um, but uh, putting both of them together pretty much limits the German choices for diplomacy. Either they take Hungary as an ally and try to build into Romania and Yugoslavia and so on to build up some people. Uh, in my eight playthroughs, the thing that I came up with was very similar to what we do now. We conquer Poland, we line up to go after Hungary. We hope that we get a political success of some sort, put it in Yugoslavia, do not activate Hungary. And then conquer Hungary because the restricted political success now will allow you to activate Yugoslavia because you're playing a political success and it is adjacent to the country that you just conquered, Hungary, and it's adjacent to an active country, Germany. So you could activate Yugoslavia by conquest. That is a subtle change that they have given you because they're forcing everything to be adjacent so they have allowed you to go ahead and do that. I don't know if that was the intent of the rule, but from what I've read of the rule, that's what it's telling you that you can do. It used to be that by conquest, you could only place a marker. You couldn't activate a country. Now it simply says you get a restricted political success, which means you get a political success that has to be adjacent to the country you conquered and adjacent to a country that's active. In the case of conquering Hungary, if you have a pro marker in Yugoslavia, it's adjacent to Germany, it's adjacent to Hungary, so you get to play a political success in the Yugoslavia. If you already have a pro marker there, uh, the rules say if it gets a second one, it can be activated. So you can activate Yugoslavia, and then Yugoslavia has a border with Romania and Bulgaria and Greece, which means further political successes can be placed further out than if you just had Hungary as an ally. You'd only have Yugoslavia and Romania. So I don't think it saved Hungary. I think it just set us up to do using Hungary a slightly different way than we did before. Used to just take it to get an extra pro marker and maybe remove something that the Allies did. Um, now it's more of a, you're going to take it to activate Yugoslavia. And then depending on when Bessarabia is taken and stuff, you'll probably get to Romania. I did put a post up in Board Game Geek. Uh, the math that I did, you're going to get one political success for in the cup for taking out Poland. Whether you put it in Lithuania or Hungary, it's really not going to matter because you're not going to really use it. Um, on the immediate pull afterwards, you have a 4 and 13 chance of getting a success, one of the better odds of the game. If you get that, then you would drop it in Yugoslavia. You line up to take out Hungary, attack Hungary, use the, uh, the, limited, the restricted political success to activate Yugoslavia. You still have another one put in the cup. But even if you're waiting for Bessarabia, the count goes, you need one for Yugoslavia and two for Romania, or one for Romania, so that's two. You need three, four for Bulgaria. And assuming you're going to use the unrestricted political success you get for conquering France, five, six to activate Italy. And that just gets you to... Um, roughly the original start thing. I mean, if you went, if you wanted to go historical, it would be you place in Hungary, pull one, Hungary becomes an ally. They, at some point, they take Bessarabia. You get pull another one, you get Romania. You still need two to get Bulgaria, and then you need three to take Rome. So no matter how you look at it, to get any of these allies in the Balkans and Rome and Italy, you need six successes. Um, based on what you conquer, if you don't conquer Hungary, you're only going to ever get uh, if you went historical, you'd get one for Denmark, one for the Netherlands, one for Belgium, and one for Norway, but you don't get Netherlands and Belgium for quite a while. Um, so that's four plus the three that start there. That's seven. You'll get another one for France, which is eight total successes in the cup. And the cup starts with um, nine non-successes for the Axis. A political failure, two areas seized, and six no events. So you're not even at 50-50 on the 
chits in the cup, and you're going to have to pull like at least six of them. Six out of eight. That's a steep climb. Just to get to historical. Just to get to the historical level that you're at, having Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, and Italy. Um, and that includes conquering Norway, which now is really a pointless endeavor. It's just, it's a drain on your resources for a plus one in a strategic warfare. And it's probably not worth it to do it early. Um, it just gives the British a chance to do the, the Norwegian gamut. And um, you'll have to look at some other games about what the Norwegian gamut is. Uh, but basically it's the, the West goes and tries to contest Norway. Uh, before the fall of France kind of thing. Keep the Germans having to use resources up there to, to hang on to it. And if they don't, if they just go ahead and go after France, um, basically you're trading Norway for France. And uh, Norway in allied hands makes it very hard for the Germans to get back there because there's no way that they can get a pro marker in Sweden and activate them to give them a way to attack in. So they have to try and use a surprise attack marker. And against British troops, that's a lot harder to, to take on than... Uh, against Norwegians. So it can be very, very uh, disconcerting if you're dealing with that. Okay, so you got my opinions. Uh, I did try to explain how the, the political thing is going to work. It's going to be a whole different game in the political cup. It's going to be very, very restrictive on the axis. And like I said, I've played eight games and I only got Italy once. Um, I got to the point of having a couple in there, but um, you know, the lucky pull by the Allies, and they would remove one from Rome, so I, now I need two. By the time that France fell, the one time I got it, France fell, and I happened to have two in there, so I got to activate them when France fell. But other than that, I've had a very hard time trying to get Rome and any kind of Allies in the Balkans. It's just, there's not enough pulls. You have to make decisions. Um, having Italy as an ally is... People might think, oh, all those units, they got 10 ground units, 5 garrisons and 5 infantry. But they have to garrison North Africa. So that's at least 2 infantry and a couple garrisons there. You need to put somebody in Sardinia, otherwise the French will just walk over it. Um, you can't really save roads. It's just going to die if the British want it. And then the rest has to be in Italy and along the French border, depending on when it comes in. Or at least enough in Italy to make sure that the British can't do a surprise invasion and suddenly, you know, take a bunch of Italian stuff away. So, <clears throat> and supply in the Mediterranean, uh, un unless you can somehow cripple the, the UK, and the only way to do that is to go take these two factories, which is very hard to do if all you have is Libya front. Um, I have done it, but it also messes up your Barbarossa campaign, and amongst other things. It's a very, very dicey situation. Um, they're kind of forcing this to go down history, and my answer is going to be that I'm probably not even going to bother to go after Italy until after I've established Yugoslavia, Romania, maybe even Bulgaria, and then try and sneak some things in on Turkey um, first, and then not worry about Italy at all. Um, It's, it's going to be a very different game. The Germans, I think, in the long run, you're going to see way more Allied victories than you are going to see Axis victories. It's going to take a fluke to have the Axis actually win in, the, in this game from now on. Um, they just they can't stand up to an, an entire 1943 active Soviet Union. It, they just can't can slow them down, but they can't stop them. And if they're slowing them down, then they can't stop the West. Uh, so it's going to come down to a lot of axis. I mean, it'll probably play out until uh, they did give, they did do one other thing. They shortened all the games so that the end of turn will be in May of 45 instead of July of 45. But with an active Soviet Union all through 1943, uh, the Germans are still going to be hard pressed to uh, be in the game because they're going to end up having to lose units to slow down the Soviets, which means their will's going to be down, which means you're not going to have to take all the cities. Probably only going to need to take half. 
you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, uh, you know, fourteen or fifteen cities you should be able to get with the allies, which is thirty willpower, and then you're probably going to have killed a good twenty German armies over the course of the game, which is fifty, which is, you know, going to be in the ballpark of where they are because they're not going to have a lot of extra conquests like they do now and they're not going to get uh, a lot of allies to help them do things. So um, I'll be interested to see what other people come up with when they play in the Vassal module. Um, it is out there. It is version 2.3.5.3. Um, there will be some more bells and whistles coming. Um, one of the things that uh, I've talked about in another video is uh, these things always stack this way. So I'd like to figure out a way to have the default thing in a stack is that it always shows you stacked like this so you can see all the units in the hex. Um, that way you don't forget where things are. Because like here it's like, oh yeah, BF is here underneath the Navy. Well, technically the Infantry should be above the Navy, and the airplanes should probably be above the infantry. Uh, Stacking-wise, and I'd like to see them always come up this way, you know, where you see them unstacked like this. But I am not sure exactly what I have to... There's something I have to change globally to do that, and then that'll happen. Um, the other thing I'm going to try and figure out how to do is to have a, a button of, like, where the count... Where the... Where is... Like, where is counters... You know, kind of like I have who's ally, they'll be like, where's counters? Uh, click on the button, you'll get a list of, you know, German, Italy, Britain, France, whatever, all the countries. And you'll be able to click on them and click on their uh, individual units with that are listed that are on the map kind of thing and say, oh, where's the where's the second panzer? And you click on it here and it'll jump the map to that location. So... I've seen it done in other games. I'm not sure exactly how to implement it, but I think that might be a good, uh, easy find kind of thing. All right. Uh, I might also put in all the countries' names um, so that you can jump to their capitals to, again, jump around the map a little bit faster. Right now, what I do in Basel games is I usually have this up, and it's like, uh, I'm attacking in the Middle East. Okay, and I'll just come down here and see what's going on. Or I'm attacking in you know, Finland or something, and you just click up there and see what's going on. This is a nice little feature to let you jump around the map, sort of a mini-map here. So it can help, but I think some of those other things might be nice. Um, I will see what I can do as far as implementing any of that, but those are not high-priority things. I wanted to make sure I had out here the setups, set up for the new errata, and to put in the uh, restricted hexes are marked now. So that you guys can play with it, with the new errata and see how it works uh let me know um either in the vassal forums or in the uh, board game geek forum what you think of the new rules and how they're playing um, it should be an interesting go for the next year or so to have a few games go here and see what people come up with all right all right with that i think i'm gonna shut up here i'm coming up on a half an hour I think that's enough time spent on this. So you've seen some of the things that have changed, some of my opinions on what's changed, and they are my opinions. They're not definitive proof of anything. Um, they're just what I've tested out. And, of course, if I'm playing against my own strategies, it's not necessarily the right thing to do or something better might not be out there to, to go ahead and do. All right. So... If you like what you see, hit the thumbs up button. Really like to see, go ahead and subscribe. Hit the notify bell. If you notified when I upload videos and our scheduled streams. This again was Unconditional Surrender with some of the changes for the 2022 errata. Uh, September 30th, I think it's dated. You can find those files on Board Game Geek uh, in the file section. And I don't think they've been published to the GMT site. Uh, Val can maybe jump in here and tell you in the thread for this video if that's true or not. Um, yep, that's it. So, until we meet again, stay safe and bye-bye.